Section 11 of the Science History of the Universe, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 4, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler chemistry chapter eight special branches in the phlogistic period part two important work on chemical affinity was contributed during this period notwithstanding the fact that the old assumption that those bodies have an affinity for one another which have something in common that affinity is governed by this remained a mental fixture with speculative chemists even into the eighteenth century the term affinitas used by albertus magnus to express this idea presupposed the similarity of substances which interact chemically as is generally the case another idea evolved itself and has lived until the present time side by side with the first to which it is exactly contradictory this considers union as dependent upon contrast on polar difference on an effort to fill up a want. This contrary idea found a devoted exponent in Bourgeve, who maintained that it is unlike substances which show the greatest tendency to combine with each other. His influence secured the general adoption of his views by chemists. After the time of Glauber, and particularly after that of Boyle, much attention was paid to the process in which the forces of affinity show themselves cases of so-called simple elective affinity attractio electiva simplex a term which originated with bergman were interpreted correctly by both the chemist just named and also by mayow for instance the expulsion of ammonia from salmiac by fixed alkali by the assumption that the attraction of the latter for hydrochloric acid was greater than that of this acid for the ammonia Fluctigis Lugensals. Observations of this kind on the expulsion or precipitation of bases or acids from salts, by substances endowed with stronger powers of affinity, soon caused chemists to solve the order in which analogous bodies were separated from their compounds by others. The observations on the precipitations of metals and on the expulsions of various acids from salts by means of sulfuric and nitric acids among others may have tended in an especial degree to make clear the different strengths of affinity in analogous bodies stahl the founder of the phlogistic theory contributed important work on affinity he attempted seventeen twenty to classify the effects of affinity by arranging similar substances in a series in the order in which they expel one another from a compound. The following mechanical experiment may serve as an example. Dissolve silver in nitric acid. It will take up the silver and appear as a light liquor. Into the clear and transparent liquor throw thin strips of copper foil. The nitric acid will dissolve these and will drop the silver in the form of a powder. Pour this clear green solution onto lead foil. It will be attacked and the copper previously dissolved will be dropped. Pour off the clear solution and pour it on to zinc. It will dissolve the zinc and allow the previously dissolved lead to drop. Into this clear solution put chalk. It will be dissolved and the zinc dropped. Then to this solution add spirits of urine, which will combine with it, releasing the chalk. And finally drop in lye. The solution will take it up and allow the volatile salt to go. Jeffrey used such a classification as the basis of his Table of Affinities, Tables de Rapport, 1718, in an arrangement destined to become very popular. The principle was to arrange similar substances so that the one following was always expelled by the one proceeding from combination with the one heading the list. When thus represented, Stahl's example just quoted becomes nitric acid, potash, ammonia, lime, zinc, lead, 
copper, silver. But yet another most important discovery concerning the action of affinity is due to Stahl. He recognized the fact that a reaction occurring at one temperature in one direction could be reversed at another temperature that at ordinary temperatures columel is decomposed by silver while under the influence of heat silver chloride is decomposed by mercury such reciprocal reactions led to the suggestion to prepare tables of affinity for medium and high temperatures both for wet and dry i e fusion reactions bergman made the attempt in seventeen seventy five to work out this proposal of balms by investigating the mutual behavior of a very large number of compounds with the result that the doctrine of chemical affinity was materially advanced in so far as this was possible by such empirical work bergman's work on affinity was published in his opuscula physica et chemica his views may be summarized as follows there is a sequence in the magnitude of the elective affinities of a series of substances toward one which with they all combine and this is manifested by the fact that the one possessing the greater affinity expels from the combination the one possessing the lesser affinity this order is constant under each of the two different conditions of interaction in the moist and dry way respectively but differs under these two distinct conditions the substance of lesser affinity is completely expelled by that of greater affinity subject however to the possibility that the mass of the expelling substance may have to be very much greater than that required for simply replacing the expelled substance in the combination it is impossible to reverse such a reaction the following abstract from the table of bergman on affinity will indicate the principles upon which it was based sulfuric acid wet way barita potash and soda ammonia alumina zinc oxide iron oxide lead oxide copper oxide mercury oxide and silver oxide the dry way phlogiston barita potash soda lime magnesia metallic oxides ammonia alumina potash the wet way sulfuric acid nitric acid hydrochloric acid phosphoric acid arsenic acid acetic acid boracic acid sulfuric acid carbonic acid the dry way phosphoric acid boracic acid arsenic acid sulfuric acid nitric acid hydrochloric acid acetic acid in the table order from top to bottom gives the relative displacing power thus in combination with sulfuric acid where the action takes place in aqueous solutions barita is represented as displacing any of the substances placed below it and so with potash ammonia etc where the dry substances are subjected to heat the order is changed somewhat it was recognized then that the strength of affinity varied with the temperature this is the attractio electiva simplex of bergman he recognized also an attractico electiva duplex mackay made use of the term affinitus reciproca where two bodies seem to have nearly the same strength of affinity for a third substance one replacing the other under slightly changed conditions a partial recognition of the fact that affinity is dependent upon other conditions besides temperature this should have sufficed to show the unreliable character of the various tables offered, but chemists were slow to give them up. Nor did they value at its true worth the remarkable work of Berthollet in the next period and his conclusion that the action of affinity was proportional to the masses of the interacting substances. This, properly understood, entirely did away with all such tables for a body with lesser affinity could displace one of greater provided it was present in a sufficiently greater mass among the chemists of this period who wrote treatises on the subject of affinity may be mentioned limburg seventeen sixty one marer seventeen sixty two wenzel seventeen seventy seven kier seventeen seventy eight weiglib seventeen eighty elliot seventeen eighty six 
Guyton de Morveau, 1786, and Schmeider, 1799. The growth of applied chemistry during the phlogistic period is next to be recorded. This division of the science was especially assisted in its development by that indispensable branch, analytical chemistry, in which notable advances were made. Qualitative chemical analysis, which had its beginnings in the iatrochemical period, was developed by the investigations of Boyle, Hoffman, Margraff, Scheele, and Bergman. The first named introduced the word analysis for those chemical reactions by which individual substances could be detected in the presence of one another, and considerably advanced the analytical examination of substances in the wet way. He employed reagents to distinguish the important classes of compounds, and the systematic use of plant juices as indicators for the detection of acids, bases, and neutral substances originated with him. For this purpose, he used the coloring matters in the juices of litmus, violets, and cornflowers. Among the other reagents he introduced may be mentioned solutions of calcium and silver salts for the recognition of sulfuric and hydrochloric acids, respectively, infusions of oak leaves or gall nuts for the detection of solutions of the salts of iron, and volatile alkaline salt for the recognition of copper salts. He recognized ammonia by the white cloud that resulted when it came in contact with fuming acids, such as hydrochloric or nitric acids. Hoffman busied himself in analytical chemistry, mainly with the investigation of mineral waters. He examined many samples and showed that they contained carbonic acid, iron, common salt, and salts of magnesia and lime. He furnished valuable information as to the methods of testing for these substances, and also indicated many characteristics of mineral waters. The Tabelle Hubert Enigue 40 Mineral Wasser was an important contribution by Carl A. Hoffman, 1789. Margraff, besides proving that gypsum consisted of lime and sulfuric acid, and that the latter was also a constituent of heavy spar, made use of the different colorations which the salts of soda and potash impart to a flame as a means for their recognition, and employed a solution of prussiate of potash as a test for iron. Scheele made many valuable observations in analytical chemistry. He it was who perceived the difference between soluble and insoluble silicic acid, and effected the separation of iron and manganese by acetic acid, in addition to independently observing the flame colorations of salts of soda and potash, and explaining the difference between the inner and outer flames of the blowpipe, a piece of apparatus which was introduced into chemistry by Gahn, Kronstadt, and Bergman. The latter was indebted to Scheele for many observations, but was more systematic than his contemporary. He suggested the use of liver of sulfur and sugar of lead as regents, of hydrochloric acid or carbonate of potash to open up ores, and of methods for the separation of salts and the estimation of precipitates. The tests he employed for the recognition of sulfuric, hydrosulfuric, carbonic, arsenious, and oxalic acids, and of lime, barita, and copper, are still in use. Bergman was, to quote von Meyer, probably the first to proceed on the principle that an element should not be itself isolated and estimated according to its own weight, but separated in the most convenient form as an insoluble precipitate for example lime earth as oxalate of lime and sulfuric acid as sulfate of barita in the determination of the weights of metallic precipitates this procedure in conjunction with the endeavors of margraff homburg scheele and black to take the proportions by weight into account in other words to determine the quantity of a substance or substances present in a solution furnished important preparatory work for the quantitative investigations of the next period. In the analysis of gases, the most noteworthy work on the period was done by Cavendish, 
who made a determination of the amount of oxygen in the air by exploding with hydrogen he found that the oxygen amounted on average to twenty point eighty five per cent a result which is only five hundredths per cent short of the mean as determined at the present day it was learned that carbonic acid and oxygen could be estimated volumetrically by the use of absorptives caustic potash was used for the absorption of the former and phosphorus for that of oxygen mainly owing to the efforts of such investigators as boyle kunkel margraf and duhamel de monceau technical chemistry made considerable progress during the phlogistic period in metallurgy correct explanation of many processes were brought out although in general it may be said that the methods of extracting metals from their ores underwent little improvement in the manufacture of iron and steel however some material changes were made as a result of the investigations of bergman gone rinman and rene remur the latter's work l'art de converter le fer forge and a sieur de l'art de adoucir la fur fondu ou de fer de ouvrages du fur fondu à ce fin que de fer forge published in paris in seventeen twenty two brought the author a pension of twelve thousand francs from the duke of orleans because of the improvements it effected in the manufacture of cast iron and steel an account of remur's method of softening cast iron was also embodied in horn's essays concerning iron and steel a work of useful observations published in london in seventeen seventy three de hamel improved the manufacture of brass and Margraf introduced a more satisfactory method of preparing zinc from calamine. A valuable treatise by Knuckel on the ceramic art and glass-making appeared in 1689. This work was entitled Ars Vitraria Experimentalis, and contained Neri's Arte Vitraria, with additions by Kunkel and others. After the introduction of the importation of chinaware, many attempts were made to imitate this true porcelain in this botker sixteen eighty five to seventeen nineteen made the first advance in seventeen o nine although it is now known that a porcelain of soft paste was made at florence as early as fifteen eighty botker made a red ware but eventually by employing kaolin he made a true porcelain at meissen the process of manufacture remained a secret, however, and it was not until it was solved at Sevres in 1769 by the experimental work of Remur and other chemists that the manufacture spread. In England, porcelain appears to have been experimentally manufactured at Fulham by Dwight as early as 1671, but it was not produced in quantity until about 1730, when works were established at Bow in this connection higgins experiments and observations made with the view of improving the art of composing and applying calcareous cements seventeen eighty should be mentioned this treatise contained the results of valuable experimental investigations on the induration and strength of cements two works of great aid to the dyer marquer's l'art de la tinture en soie seventeen sixty three and Hello's L'Art de la Tenture de Lyons et Etosophus de Lain, seventeen fifty to seventeen eighty six, in that they contained speculations upon the manner in which dyeing operations are carried out, appeared during this period. Stahl, Hello, and Macure divided dyes into two classes, viz., those capable of being fixed on cloth without the aid of mordants and those requiring the use of such agents and in seventeen ninety four bancroft distinguished these divisions as adjective and substantive dyes prussian blue was discovered by diceback in seventeen ten sulfuric acid the manufacturer of which constitutes one of the most important branches of modern technical chemistry owing to the great variety of purposes for which it is required was first manufactured on a large scale by a quack physician of the name of ward about the middle of the eighteenth century 
for this manufacture he employed glass globes of about forty fifty gallons capacity a small amount of water being poured into the globe a stoneware pot was introduced and on this a red-hot iron ladle was placed a mixture of sulphur and saltpeter was then thrown into this ladle and the vessel was closed the vapors evolved were absorbed by the water and sulphuric acid was obtained roebuck of birmingham was the first to suggest the use of leaden chambers instead of glass globes these leaden chambers were set up in birmingham in seventeen forty six and were worked intermittently the continuous working of them is an achievement of the nineteenth century the manufacture of fuming sulphuric acid was first carried out at nordhausen in the haars by heating roasted green vitriol but was subsequently removed to bohemia ruel demonstrated that nitric acid could be concentrated by distillation with sulphuric acid a number of improvements were made in the manufacture of this acid by stahl and other chemists but hydrochloric acid was not prepared in large quantities as it was not employed technically as early as sixteen seventy an artist henry schwanhardt prepared hydrofluoric acid for etching figures on glass and it is probable that his preparation was the same as that known to some artists as a secret in seventeen twenty one and published by Weigand in 1725. The alkalis and their carbonates were obtained just as in ancient times, viz. from the ashes of plants, incrustations on the soil, and carbonized tartar. However, it was shown by Duhamel and other chemists that common salt could be converted first into sulfate of soda, and finally into carbonate of soda. A description of such a process is contained in the description de divers proceeds pour extraire le sud de sel marine, published by the imprimerie du Camite du Salut Public in 1795. Duhamel also introduced suitable methods of preparing starch and soap, and improved the processes of manufacturing sal ammoniac and sugar. His L'Art de Raffiner le Sucre, 1764 was held in high esteem in this period margraf's discovery of cane sugar in the juice of the red beet has been referred to it only remains to say that it laid the foundation for the now enormous and important beet sugar industry the knowledge of the chemical elements and compounds was enlarged to a remarkable degree in the phlogistic period and the discoveries made and facts learned afterward became of great technical importance six new elements chlorine phosphorus manganese cobalt nickel and platinum were added to the ones already known phosphorus was obtained by brand a hamburg alchemist in sixteen sixty nine by distilling the residue from evaporated urine he called it cold fire and in sixteen seventy one johann elschultz of vienna gave it the same name as the bologna stone or phosphor which was discovered about sixteen o three the discovery of phosphorus caused much excitement on account of its properties but its preparation was kept secret and it was only after many endeavors that boyle and kunkel discovered the method of obtaining it the phosphorus described by balduinus in sixteen seventy five is thought to have been dry calcium nitrate while that discovered by homberg in sixteen ninety three was oxychloride of calcium kunkel in several treatises on phosphorus gave an account of its discovery and contributed to a better knowledge of the element the first account of metallic manganese was given in the de metallis de Buis of jacob winterl and j g came which was published in vienna in seventeen seventy gone however is generally credited with its isolation which he effected in seventeen seventy four cobalt was discovered by brandt in seventeen forty two and the earliest full account of the metal is contained in johann gessner's historia cadme fossilis metallica sive cobalti which appeared the next year nickel was first prepared by cronstedt in seventeen fifty 
the observations of arvidsson on this interesting metal were published in seventeen seventy five platinum is first referred to in don antonio de ulio's relation historica del viage a la america meridonial seventeen forty eight william watson an english chemist was the first to examine the platina de pinto found in the spanish west indies by explorers and his observations along with brownrigg's experiments on the metal were published in the philosophical transactions of the london royal society in seventeen fifty one watson's experiments were continued by lewis in seventeen fifty five macaire in seventeen fifty eight and margraf in seventeen sixty one de buffon asserted that platinum was an alloy of gold and iron and von milly considered that it contained these metals together with mercury its elementary nature was not established to the satisfaction of all until the next period the knowledge of organic compounds was also considerably extended and new fields for organic chemistry were opened up toward the close of the period however the real composition of all organic compounds was not ascertained until the time of lavoisier boyle investigated dry distillation and proved that the liquid obtained by the distillation of wood is not a simple body but that it contains besides proliginous acid an indifferent body which may be separated by distillation over burnt coral the crude wood spirit thereby procured he termed adiaphorous spirit he also wrote on the production and rectification of alcohol a subject of frequent investigation by the chemists who followed him spirit of wine was prepared fairly pure and was used in analytical chemistry for the separation of various salts but confused opinions were held with respect to its formation in spirituous fermentation processes attempts were made by remure in seventeen thirty three and mathurin brisson in seventeen sixty eight to determine the amount of alcohol in aqueous solutions containing it from its specific gravity an interesting treatise on wines hubert de verschong der wein was written by friedrich kartheuser in seventeen seventy nine frobenius seventeen thirty hoffmann pot and twan baum seventeen fifty seven and cadet de gassicourt seventeen seventy five investigated ether spiritus vini vitriolatus but until eighteen hundred it was believed to contain sulphur a mixture of ether with alcohol known as hoffman's drops and the compound ethers were used officinally shield discovered or first clearly distinguished the important organic acids showing that grapes contained one tartaric acid which differs from that found in lemons citric acid that another malic acid occurred in apples and again a new one oxalic acid was detected in wood sorrel the later he prepared by the oxidation of cane sugar with nitric acid and found that it differed from the one obtained by treating milk sugar with nitric acid music acid he also discovered lactic acid in sour milk uric acid in bladder stones and prussic acid by decomposing yellow prussiate of potash with sulfuric acid and improved the methods of preparing gallic and benzoic acids he showed that the latter forms a lime salt freely soluble in cold water and therefore may be readily obtained by boiling gum benzoin with milk of lime concentrating the filtrate and separating the acid by means of hydrochloric acid on the other hand he learned that malic tartaric and citric acids formed in soluble salts with lime or lead oxide by the aid of which substances they might be separated from other bodies in the fruit he prepared the acids by decomposing their lime or lead salts thus obtained with sulfuric acid formic acid was discovered by ray in 1760 and was further investigated by arfinson and cern in 1777 its resemblance to acetic acid which was now prepared in a pure form was soon observed and this produced some confusion margraf proved that they differed 
oils and fats were frequently investigated and scheele showed that they contained a common constituent oleusis or the sweet principle of oils this is now known as glycerin or glycerol scheele stated that i is related to sugar not only because of its taste but also on account of the fact that both substances yield oxalic acid in treatment with nitric acid the importance of this discovery was not realized until a much later date considerable progress was made during this period in medical and pharmaceutical chemistry and many new medicines came into vogue among these were carbonate of ammonia sulphate of potash magnesia alba and sulphate of magnesia among the textbooks which appeared may be mentioned the following the manductio ad chemian pharmacilium of Ravinus, 1690 fix chemicorum in pharmacopoeia et londinensi explicatio 1711 von ludolf's die in der medicin sigand chemie 1750 and baum's elements de pharmacie theorique et pratique 1762 the advances made in organic and medical chemistry prepared the ground for the physiological chemistry a branch which has been greatly developed in the most recent period end of section 11 recording by lawrence trask mount vernon ohio interfaceaudio.com section 12 of the science history of the universe volume 4 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lawrence trask mount vernon ohio interfaceaudio.com the science history of the universe volume 4 edited by francis rolt wheeler Chemistry, Chapter Nine, Lavoisier and Antiphlogisticism, Part One. Chapter Nine, Lavoisier and the Antiphlogistic Chemistry. It has been seen how far the development of chemical knowledge during the seventeenth century was influenced by Stahl's phlogistic theory. That this theory exerted a decided influence on the progress of chemistry, but that it was too elastic to give exact definition to the tendency of investigation it had however done good work since it coordinated facts and developed unity of purpose and served admirably as a period of preparation for the scientific experimental work of the era commencing with the discovery of oxygen by scheele and priestley the modern chemical period for twenty years following this discovery a contest concerned mainly with the recognition of the experimental method was pursued it had to do with the support of the method of observation under definite conditions as the foundation of all theoretic inferences and views and with the subduction of the prejudices which had resulted from following the method which fostered speculation and the adaptation of observations as far as possible to the established system this short period of revolution seventeen seventy four to seventeen ninety four is rendered radiant by the reforms of one of the most remarkable men in the history of science lavoisier who abolished old prejudices and masterfully applied scientific principles to the explanation of chemical phenomena his combustion theory supplanted the doctrine of phlogiston a change it is true that primarily only required the substitution of the words addition of oxygen for withdrawal of phlogiston but which eventually resulted in a complete transformation of all ideas concerning combustion calcination and respiration and consequently the views respecting chemical composition a displacement which culminated in the conversion of the chemistry dominated by the dogma of stahl into the anti-phlogistic system the new chemistry the phlogistic theory was deposed by the theory of oxygen but as wool has pointed out this circumstance must not lead us to overlook the really sound and permanent part of the opinions which the founders of the phlogistic theory taught in this connection 
we must not forget how much Lavoisier owed to his predecessors. He sifted and collated the facts handed down to him by the phlogistonists, and mainly from the standpoint of the physicist, gave correct explanations of many processes. But he made no independent chemical discoveries, and is honored not as a Scheele or Black, but as the founder of a new system based on his comprehensive and correct explanations of the observations of other investigators. Consequently, it may be said that Gallic patriotic bias prompted words to state him in his Histoire de Doctrines Chimiques that Le Chimay est une science française, an assertion which was repeated twenty years later by Jagnon since however chemistry only took rank as a science when quantitative work was made its basis lavoisier must be given credit above all others in having directed it into and along this road antoine laurent lavoisier was born in paris on the twenty sixth of august seventeen forty three his father was wealthy and spared no expense on his education in his twenty first year lavoisier obtained a gold medal from the academy of sciences for an essay on the most appropriate method of lighting the streets of paris but it was some years before he made definite choice of his subject he published memoirs relating to geology and to mathematics before the fame of blacks and priestley's discoveries reached him and induced him to turn his attention to scientific chemistry by good business management he greatly added to his property and became a man of wealth he lived well giving dinners which were famed for their excellence and for the company gathered at them this attracted attention to him and won for him some enemies whose influence was felt in the storm gathering against all that smacked of aristocracy in addition he was a fernier general and though he brought about some reforms some of his measures proposed to the government were exceedingly unpopular as for instance his plan for taxing paris impeached under the reign of terror he was condemned to death and was executed together with twenty-eight other fermiers generaux on the eighth of may seventeen ninety four in lavoisier is seen a master mind not only capable of devising and conducting experiments but mainly of assimilating those of others and deducing from them their correct significance although his additions to the known chemical compounds were few in number and cannot as mentioned be compared with those of scheele or of priestley yet his reasoning in disproof of the phlogistic theory was so exact that it readily secured conviction and laid the foundation for the new chemistry of the quantitative era hitherto exclusive importance had been attached to visible phenomena but lavoisier introduced a more exhaustive investigation of chemical reactions and the relations of quantity the important work in which he recognized and explained the part played by oxygen in the process of combustion calcination and respiration embodies the chief investigations of his life however and in this lies his abiding service to science the earlier observations of ray mayow and others who had attributed the increase in weight of the metals during their calcination to an absorption of air contain only the first germs of the true explanation of these processes from the year seventeen seventy two lavoisier engaged in investigations bearing upon this subject the first results of which he delivered in a sealed note to the French Academy in November 1st of that year. This note was to the following effect. About eight days ago I discovered that sulfur, when burned, instead of losing weight, gains weight, that is to say, from one pound of sulfur, much more than one pound of vitriolic acid is produced, not counting the moisture gained from the air. Phosphorus presents the same phenomenon this increase in weight is due to a great quantity of air which becomes fixed during the combustion and which combines with the vapors this discovery which i confirmed by experiments which i regard as decisive led me to think that what was observed in the combustion of sulphur and phosphorus
might likewise take place with respect to all the bodies which augment in weight by combustion and calcination and i was persuaded that the gain of weight in calces of metals proceeded from the same cause experiment fully confirmed my conjectures i effected the reduction of lethargy in closed vessels of hale's apparatus and i observed at the moment of the passage of the calx into the metallic state there was a disengagement of air in considerable quantity and that this air formed a volume at least a thousand times greater than that of the lethargy employed as this discovery appears to me to be one of the most interesting which has been made since the time of stahl i thought it expedient to secure myself the property by depositing the present note in the hands of the secretary of the academy to remain secret till the period when i shall publish my experiments lavoisier he was however in the same position as Mayow had been that is still in doubt as to which portion of the air caused this increase in weight as to the air itself being a mixture of gases and especially as to the nature of the process which occurred in the reduction of the lethargy he felt inclined to regard the generated gas carbonic acid as the fluid originally combined with the lead this uncertainty was brought about by his giving little attention to the qualitative side of the chemical reactions in 1774 after repeating these and similar investigations lavoisier found his error with regard to the reduction of lethargy and furnished more elaborate details of his observations especially of the calcination of tin he began by considering the possible solutions of the problem and then investigated what changes really do occur from which he inferred the cause to quote from his uvas thus when did i at the beginning reason with myself if the increase in the weight of metals calcined in closed vessels is due as boyle had thought to the addition of the matter of the flame and the fire which penetrate the pores of the glass and combine with the metals then it follows that on introducing a known weight of metal into a glass vessel and sealing this hermetically determining the weight exactly then proceeding to calcination by a charcoal fire just as boyle had done and then finally after calcination before opening it again weighing the same vessel this weight must be found augmented by that of the whole quantity of fire matter which had been introduced during calcination but if said i to myself the increase in the weight of the metal calx is not due to the addition of fire matter nor of any other extraneous matter but to the fixation of a portion of the air contained in the vessel the whole vessel after calcination must be no heavier than before and must merely be partially void of air and the increase in the weight of the vessel will not occur until after the air required has entered to test these theoretical considerations lavoisier selected the calcination of lead and of tin in sealed retorts from two careful experiments with eight ounces of tin similar ones with lead were unsuccessful lavoisier found that the increase in weight of the tin on calcination was practically identical with the weight of the air which took the place of that absorbed during calcination his conclusions were as follows summing up the results of the two experiments on tin just described it seems to me impossible not to draw the following conclusions first in a given volume of air only a fixed quantity of tin can be calcined secondly the quantity is greater in a large retort than in a small one thirdly the hermetically sealed retorts weighed before and after the calcination of the tin contained in them showed no difference of weight which evidently proves that the increase in weight of the metals arises neither from the fire matter nor from any other matter extraneous to the vessel fourthly in all calcinations of the tin the increase in the weight of the metal is sufficiently nearly equal to the weight of the air absorbed 
to prove that the portion of the air which combines with metal during calcination is of specific gravity approximately equal to that of atmospheric air thus the problem he had undertaken had been solved by lavoisier he had ascertained the cause of the increase in the weight of metals on calcination and had found it to be combination with a certain portion of the air and having proved before that sulphur and phosphorus on burning also increase in weight and absorb a large volume of air lavoisier must at that stage as freund remarks be supposed to have established that combustion consists in combination with a portion of the atmospheric air whereby the increase in weight on combustion is accounted for however he knew nothing as yet concerning the nature of the portion of the air absorbed in the time between the memoir on the calcination of tin and his next contribution to the subject of combustion falls priestley's discovery of a gas obtainable by the heating of red oxide of mercury the investigation of the properties of this gas and the recognition that it is a better supporter of combustion than ordinary air lavoisier learned of this new fact and his next paper bears evidence of the manner in which he was helped thereby this paper which was written in seventeen seventy five was entitled on the nature of the principle which combines with metals during their calcination and which increases their weight in this he describes experiments showing that when metallic calces are converted into metals by heating with charcoal a quantity of fixed air is expelled and here for the first time he pointed out that fixed air is a compound of carbon with the elastic fluid contained in the calx he then described the preparation of oxygen by priestley's process of heating red oxide of mercury mercurius precipitatus per se and showed that the red oxide when heated with charcoal exhibited the properties of a true calx inasmuch as metallic mercury was formed and a large quantity of fixed air was produced in seventeen seventy six lavoisier observed that the combustion product of the diamond was composed of carbonic acid alone and in his next paper which appeared the following year he dealt with the combustion of phosphorus he recapitulated rutherford's experiments and showed that one-fifth of the air disappeared and that the residue to which he gave the name mouffe atmospherique is incapable of supporting combustion as mentioned rutherford named this residue phlogisticated air since he imagined it to have absorbed phlogiston from the burning phosphorus Scheele too had made a similar experiment with a like result from these observations lavoisier concluded that air consists of a mixture or compound of two gases one capable of absorption by burning bodies the other incapable of supporting combustion the results of these investigations along with the observations of Scheele and priestley and a research on the combustion of organic substances made in seventeen seventy seven the products of which he showed to be water and carbonic acid enabled lavoisier to enunciate his views on combustion in a memoir published in seventeen seventy eight the main points of this combustion or oxidation theory are as follows substances burn only in pure air air eminent pure two this air is consumed in the combustion and the increase in weight of the substance burnt is equivalent to the decrease in weight of the air three the combustible body as a rule converted into an acid by its combination with the pure air but the metals on the other hand into metallic calces hence the mechanism of combustion according to lavoisier is represented by metal plus oxygen equals metal calx metal calx minus oxygen equal metal carbon withdraws oxygen forming fixed air in direct contradiction to the phlogistic scheme metal minus phlogiston equals metal calx in seventeen eighty three 
there appeared a memoir by Lavoisier entitled Reflections Concerning Phlogiston. After explaining the phenomena of combustion and reduction as a combination with oxygen or its separation, he proclaimed the non-existence of phlogiston, saying in part as follows, but if in chemistry everything can be satisfactorily explained without the aid of phlogiston, it thereby becomes eminently probable that such a principle does not exist, that it is a hypothetical being, a gratuitous assumption, and sound logic is opposed to unnecessary complication. Perhaps I might have confined myself to these negative proofs and remained content to show that the phenomena can be better explained without phlogiston than by means of it but the time has come when i must speak out in a more definite and formal manner concerning a view which i consider an error fatal to chemistry and which appears to me to have considerably retarded progress by the method of false reasoning it has engendered all these reflections prove that i have advanced what has been my object to demonstrate what i will repeat once more namely that chemists have turned phlogiston into a vague principle one not rigorously defined and which consequently adapts itself to all the explanations for which it may be required sometimes this principle has weight and sometimes it has not sometimes it is free fire and sometimes it is fire combined with the earthly element sometimes it passes through the pores of vessels sometimes these are impervious to it it explains both causticity and non-causticity transparency and opacity colors and their absence it is a veritable proteus changing in forms at each instant it was in this year that his important memoir upon the composition of water appeared and it was this research which removed the last obstacles which the anti-phlogistic system had to contend james watt the scotch inventor was the first to state distinctly that water is not an element but that it is composed weight for weight of two other substances one of which he considered to be phlogiston and the other dephlogisticated air and john waltire a friend of priestley was one of the first chemists to note that the deposit of moisture on the inside of a tube after exploding a mixture of air and inflammable gas to cavendish however belongs the credit of having first supplied the correct experimental basis upon which accurate knowledge alone could be founded when lavoisier learned that cavendish had proved that water alone is produced by the combustion of hydrogen information which was imparted to him by sir charles blagden in seventeen eighty two he immediately repeated cavendish's experiments on a large scale and was assisted on that occasion by laplace blagden also being present a large quantity of water was produced and the volumes of the combining gases were found to be one of oxygen to one point ninety one of hydrogen not long after in conjunction with munier he performed the converse operation in decomposing steam by conducting it over iron wire heated to redness in a porcelain tube the iron removed the oxygen from the water while the hydrogen passed on and was collected in the gas holder the explanation of the solution of metals in acids was now simple it depended on the decomposition of water while the oxygen combined with the metal to form a calx the hydrogen was evolved the calx dissolved in the acid forming a salt in the metal the operation of producing hydrogen by the action of steam on red-hot iron met with an equally easy explanation the oxygen and iron united to form an oxide the ancient ethiops marshal while the hydrogen escaped the converse occurred during the reduction of a calx to the metallic state by hydrogen in this case the hydrogen seized on the oxygen of the calx removed it in the form of water and the metal was left these experiments were due to cavendish all that lavoisier did was to indicate and prove the true nature of the phenomena the opponents of the new doctrines priestly prime among them 
exerted themselves to disprove the view that water was a compound of oxygen and hydrogen but their efforts were in vain many of lavoisier's opponents had to admit the justice of his views and chemists of standing commenced the application of his ideas first in france berthollet seventeen eighty six de marveau and the cautious fourcroy not until seventeen eighty seven and soon in other countries also kirwan for example in seventeen ninety two Lavoisier's critical treatises, which were directed to showing the untenability of the phlogistic theory, conjoined with his trait de chimie, gave the final blow to that doctrine. The new doctrine was accepted by the most prominent chemists after the comparatively short time which was required to put it to the proof. From the year 1792, after Klaproth, followed Hermstadt, Gertner, etc., in Germany, Kirwan and Higgins in England, Trustwick, Diamond, and Van Merum in Holland, and Gilbert, Bugnatelli, etc., in Italy, had signified their adhesion to it. One may speak of the final victory of Lavoisier's system, and this notwithstanding the fact that still many chemists of great eminence refused to accept it in its full extent. For example, de la Mathurie, Sage, and Beaumet in France, Westrom, Grand Kral, and Weigleb in Germany gadolin and retzius in switzerland and cavendish and priestley in england some opponents of the new system mainly owing to their misinterpretation of the lavoisierian views continued to combat it till about eighteen hundred as late as seventeen ninety six lamarck for example wrote an attack on the lavoisierian theory of combustion in which he referred to the pretended existence of a material called oxygen which the pneumatic chemists have never seen nor studied and the existence of which they imagined to explain the effects of fixed acidific air a few words should be said in this connection with regard to lavoisier's views on the relation of plants and animals to the atmosphere Priestley already knew that oxygen was necessary for respiration, but his unfamiliarity with accurate analytical work, and his close adherence to the phlogiston theory, prevented him from arriving at a true explanation of the facts he observed. Lavoisier showed how oxygen was used up in the lungs, in the formation of carbonic acid and of water, and how this process which he properly classed as one of combustion, furnishes to man the heat necessary for his existence. He demonstrated that the expired carbonic acid derives its carbon from the blood itself, that in the process of respiration we thus, to a certain extent, burn ourselves, and would consume ourselves if we did not replace, by means of our food, that which we have burned the experiments which lavoisier made on respiration show the clearness of his methods end of section twelve recording by lawrence trask mount vernon ohio interface audio dot com section thirteen of the science history of the universe volume four this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 4. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Chemistry, Chapter 9, Lavoisier and Antiphlogisticism, Part 2 one of lavoisier's earlier memoirs that presented to the academy de sciences in seventeen seventy entitled on the nature of water and on the experiments adduced in proof of the possibility of its change into earth illustrates his accuracy thoroughness and acute reasoning he states that the purpose of the research was as follows I find myself confronted with the task of settling by decisive experiments a question of interest in physics, namely whether water can be changed into earth, as was thought by the old philosophers, 
and is still thought by some chemists of the day it had been noted by many earlier investigators that when water was boiled for a long time in a glass vessel a mass of white residue was found in the vessel after evaporation this was long regarded as a conclusive proof that water could be changed into earth lavoisier weighed his glass vessel then after heating water therein for one hundred days found there was no change in the weight of the vessel and its contents when he evaporated the water he obtained a residue of earthy matter which he found corresponded within the range of experimental error with the loss in weight of the empty vessel he therefore concluded from his experiments that the greater part possibly the whole of the earth separated from rainwater by evaporation is due to the solution of the vessels in which it has been collected and evaporated scheele afterward showed that this earth or residue possessed the same composition as the glass thereby confirming lavoisier's work the old alchemical idea of transmutation was thus shown to be false and was finally dismissed from chemistry lavoisier established the important generalization that matter may be changed but not destroyed nor created the matter lost from the glass vessel was merely dissolved in the water this is the principle of the indestructibility of matter the fundamental principle of modern science however it must be realized that while from the commencement of his experimental life lavoisier was guided in all his reasoning by the recognition of the principle of the conservation of mass yet it was only after he had found this view proved by his work on combustion that he enunciated it seventeen eighty five to quote from his uvers nothing is created either in the operation of art or in those of nature and it may be considered as a general principle that in every operation there exists an equal quantity of matter before and after the operation that the quality and quantity of the constituents is the same and that what happens is only changes modifications it is on this principle that is founded all the art of performing chemical experiments in all such must be assumed a true equality or equation between the constituents of the substances examined and those resulting from their analysis the establishment of the law of conservation of mass has followed curious lines as freund observes lavoisier did not arrive at it strictly inductively by generalization from a large number of cases in which the weights of the substances participating in a chemical reaction were compared with the weights of those resulting from it the available data of chemical investigations did not supply him with the material for so doing the belief growing among physicists of the imponderable nature of heat together with the old view of the indestructibility of matter in general must have supplied him with the basis for an assumption from which he drew deductions that were verified by the result of experiment generally speaking ever since his time the scientific world has been content to regard the conservation of mass as an axiom a number of lavoisier's statements indicate that his views upon the nature of his matière de chaleur matter of heat approximate to the mechanical theory of heat thus he states that heat is the energy which results from the imperceptible movements of the molecules of a substance it is the sum of the products of the mass of each molecule into the square of its velocity according to him matter consists of small particles which do not touch one another since otherwise a diminution of volume by lowering of temperature could not be explained the matter of heat exists between these particles the hotter a substance is the more of the matter of heat does it contain in the investigations into the specific heats of various substances carried out along with laplace lavoisier further proved that for a like increase in temperature substances do not take up like quantities of the matter of heat lavoisier knew that by the addition of heat 
ice is first converted into water and the water then into steam hence gases contain most of the matter of heat this is what we should understand when he says that his air pure consists of the acidifying principle and the matter of heat during combustion the former unites with the combustible substance and the matter of heat is liberated it produces light and heat lavoisier also termed the matter of heat calorique lavoisier's views with respect to the heat liberated during combustion although not quite accurate are also of great importance he considered that when a solid substance phosphorus burned in gas oxygen and the product of the combustion was solid phosphoric and hydride the disengagement of heat was due to the condensation which the gas had undergone in order that it may become solid if the product was gaseous carbonic and hydride he attributed the disengagement of heat to the alteration of the specific heat he advanced the general view that the heat of combustion must be greatest when two gases unite to form a solid substance how correctly he understood the application of these fundamental ideas is shown by his mode of explaining the lowering of temperature produced by dissolving salts in water lavoisier assumed as we do that it is the change of state of aggregation which occasions the absorption of heat he showed further that the evolution of heat which occurs on mixing sulphuric acid with water is accompanied by a decrease in volume and that both maxima coincide so that theory and experiment agree Leidenberg it may be said therefore that lavoisier laid the foundation for the modern thermochemistry lavoisier also occupied himself with organic chemistry or the chemistry of life products and made a beginning toward a scientific study of it by devising a method of analysis by which these bodies could be burned and the water and carbon dioxide which were formed measured he heated a known weight of the substance with a known weight of red mercury oxide and weighed the carbonic acid and water produced he knew the oxygen content of the mercuric oxide and so could ascertain how far this supplied the carbon and hydrogen with the oxygen they required and how far this was furnished by the compound under investigation lavoisier in this way determined the composition of alcohol however the whole system of quantitative organic chemistry was too young for lavoisier to anticipate the nicety with which liebig later could handle these methods of ultimate analysis he considered his experiments to be merely confirmatory of his system the composition of sugar a mere incident organic bodies in general he regarded as oxides of a radical which might itself contain hydrogen and carbon or in some cases these together with nitrogen sulphur and phosphorus lavoisier adhered to boyle's definition of an element with him an element was any substance which could not be further decomposed the metals and the most important non-metals were ranked among the elements and compound bodies like the alkalis ammonia and the earths were numbered among these also but not without considerable uncertainty being expressed as to their elementary nature oxygen also recognized as an element became because of its part in combustion and its capacity for combining with so many other elements the center point of the antiphlogistic system which indeed owed its inception to the knowledge of the behavior of other elements toward oxygen the importance which lavoisier attached to this gas is clearly shown in his theory of acids in which he explained the properties of acids by the hypothesis of the acidifying principle being oxygen the name of which a greek word meaning i generate acid still bears witness to this view and in the statement the bases which combine with acids also contain oxygen the composition of a large number of compounds oxygens acids and salts was thus rightly interpreted 
the phlogistic hypothesis having regarded as simple the substances belonging to the first two of these classes the views of lavoisier and his disciples with respect to elements and compounds are to be found in the treatise entitled methode de nomenclature chimique which was published by lavoisier conjointly with guyton de morveau berthollet and fourcroy in seventeen eighty seven this work in conjunction with the trait elementaire de chimie seventeen eighty nine changed the existing language of chemistry and shaped the course of progress still pursued in the first mentioned treatise all substances are divided into elements and compounds to the former belonged in addition to light and heat oxygen hydrogen and nitrogen these formed the first class the second group containing the acid forming elements sulphur phosphorus and carbon to which were added the hypothetical radicals of hydrochloric hydrofluoric and boracic acids the third class comprised the metals the fourth the earths and the fifth the alkalis but lavoisier considered the elementary nature of the last of these as so improbable that in the trait elementaire de chimie he no longer included them among the elements for the nomenclature of the latter the old names of the metals and some of the non-metals for example soufre phosphor etc were retained while lavoisier's new names for others of the non-metallic elements for example oxygen hydrogen azote were introduced next came the binary substances consisting as they did of two elements the acids occurred in this class their names were in each case composed of two words of which the first was common to them all and indicated their character acid while the second was a specific name indicating the element or radical occurring in each thus we have acides sulfurique carbonique phosphorique nitrique etc two acids containing the same element or radical were distinguished by the different termination of the specific name that containing the smaller proportion of oxygen receiving the termination eux whereby such names as acids sulfuro nitro etc were obtained hydrochloric acid was called acide muriatique and the existence of oxygen in it was assumed while oxygen was supposed to be present in still greater quantity in chlorine the acide muriatique oxygene the names of the binary substances of the second group for example of the basic compounds containing oxygen were formed in a manner exactly similar for these the general designation oxides was introduced and to this word the specific name was appended in the genitive for example oxide de zinc oxide de plomb etc the remaining binary compounds were distinguished as sulphur phosphorus carbon etc compounds and received the class names sulfures phosphures carbures etc compounds of the metals with one another were called alliages alloys the expression amalgams being retained however for mercury alloys with regard to the ternary compounds the salts alone need to be mentioned they obtained their class names from the acids from which they were derived and were called accordingly sulfates nitrates phosphates the termination eight became eight when the salts were derived from the acid poorer in oxygen instead of from that richer in oxygen the name of the base was appended for example sulfate de zinc de barite etc this system of nomenclature embodies the principles and constitutes the basis of the chemical nomenclature now in use studies of the new nomenclature were published by shearer seventeen ninety two who made an attempt to germanize the new terms seventeen ninety three who sought to reconcile the old and the new views in his synonymicon arts seventeen ninety five spalding who published a work at hanover new hampshire in seventeen ninety nine in which he followed de morveau but adapted the name septon for nitrogen and septic acid for nitric acid as proposed by samuel mitchell of new york
Severin, 1807, and Ritter, 1808. It is amusing to note here that Richard Chenevy, a London chemist, published a critical examination of the nomenclature of the French neologists in 1802, in which he quoted Balthazar Sage's remark that oxygen signified the son of a vinegar merchant. When the nature of the theoretical views held during the phlogistic period is compared with that of the ones accepted at the time of Lavoisier's execution, it will be understood why a new era, that of quantitative chemistry, or as Fourcroix termed it, the French chemistry, dates from him. As mentioned, the teachings of Lavoisier gradually became recognized in France, a reward which Lavoisier himself had the satisfaction of witnessing, and also gained ground in England, and through the influence of Klaproth in Germany, where his works were translated, so that at the beginning of the 19th century, chemists had almost universally given in their adherence to the antiphlogistic chemistry. Lavoisier not only overthrew the old theory, but it is to his credit that he introduced a new one in its place, and it is perhaps advisable to state here the most important heads of his theory, Ladenburg. 1. In all chemical reactions, it is the kind of matter alone that is changed, while its quantity remains constant. Consequently, the substances employed and the products obtained may be represented by an algebraic equation, which, if there is any unknown term, this may be calculated. In the process of combustion, the burning substance unites with oxygen, whereby an acid is usually produced. In the combustion of the metals, metallic calces are produced. All acids contain oxygen united, as he expresses it, with a basis or radical which in inorganic substances is usually an element, but in organic substances is composed of carbon and hydrogen, and frequently contains also nitrogen or phosphorus. If these three statements be contrasted with the views of the phlogistians, i.e. with the theories which prevailed prior to Lavoisier, we shall appreciate the reformation introduced by him into chemical science the direction of chemical thought was entirely changed and the facts hitherto ascertained appeared in a new light chemistry now had the basis of a correct theory and what was of greater value a knowledge that theories could be deduced only from the weight relations of actually occurring reactions to quote venable there were to be no baseless and delusive dreams for the future, although mistakes might be made in the interpretation of facts. Further, the grand division into elements and compounds had been effected, and a suitable nomenclature had been devised, capable of any expansion demanded by increase of knowledge. The balance, too, had been introduced as the instrument by which precision and accuracy were to be attained and the great arbiter of the fate of theories true progress now became possible and the century which has since passed has seen this science develop and grow until men have come scarcely to dare put a limit to its possibilities those three investigators guyton de morveau claude louise berthollet and antoine francois fourcroy who in conjunction with lavoisier furnish the basis of a scientific nomenclature and also contributed to the development of chemistry by their other works are next to be considered louis bernard guyton de morveau seventeen thirty seven to eighteen sixteen was a zealous propagandist of the new chemistry and upon his election as a deputy in seventeen ninety one he endeavored to render the chemical knowledge he had acquired and its practical application of assistance to france he aided in founding the ecole polytechnique in which institution he subsequently accepted a professorship and with Murray and durand as co-authors he published a comprehensive textbook on chemistry in three volumes entitled elements de chimie theorique et pratique seventeen seventy seven Claude Louise Berthollet, who was born at Talois in Savoy in 1748, 
was one of the most distinguished of the many contemporaries and successors of Lavoisier. He became an antiphlogistonist in 1786, and from that time until his death in 1822, he conducted valuable chemical researches. His important experimental investigations were in connection with the composition of ammonia, the properties and nature of chlorine, the production of bleaching compounds from chlorine, and the composition of hydrogen sulfide and hydrocyanic acid. He observed that solutions of chlorine in water gave off bubbles of oxygen when exposed to the action of light, while hydrochloric acid remained. Lavoisier had considered that this acid was a compound of the radical murium with oxygen, and consequently Berthollet explained the phenomenon referred to by regarding chlorine as oxymuriatic acid, that is, a higher oxygenated product of murium. Berthollet discovered that ammonia is composed of hydrogen and nitrogen, and after convincing himself that hydrogen sulfide and hydrocyanic acid contained no oxygen, he opposed the dictum that oxygen was the principle of acidity. Berthollet was the author of the following works, Elements de l'art de la teinture, 1791, Researches sur le Louis de la Finité, 1801, and Essai de Statique Chimique, 1803. The last-mentioned treatise was an exceedingly important contribution to theoretical chemistry, for it exerted a powerful influence on the question of chemical affinity. Berthollet's doctrine of affinity will be discussed in the next chapter. Antoine Francois de Fourcroy, seventeen fifty five to eighteen o nine, deserves mention as an organizer, author, and teacher. He was an active expounder of the antiphlogistic doctrine and propagated the new chemistry by means of articles and treatises. He was the author of the following works. Le Cons Elementaires de Histoire Naturelle et de Chimie, 1782. Elements de Histoire Naturelle et de Chimie, 1789. Memoirs et Observations de Chimie, 1784. Philosophie Chimique, 1792. And Systèmes de Connaissances Chimiques et Lure, Applications aux Phénomènes de la Nature et de l'Art, 1801. Fourcroy's experimental work served to pave the way for biological chemistry, and his joint investigations with Vaculin furthered the knowledge of organic compounds. Another important representative of chemistry in France at this time was Louise Nicolas Vaculin, seventeen sixty three to eighteen twenty nine, who succeeded Fourcroy as professor of chemistry to the medical faculty in eighteen o nine. To Vacayen is owed the discovery of chromium, 1797, and beryllia, 1797, the former of which he found in lead spar and the latter in beryl. His work on the separation of platinum, palladium, discovered by Wollaston in 1803, rhodium, Wollaston, 1804, iridium, tenant, 1803, and osmium, tenant, 1803, is also worthy of note. Vacayen's investigation on the metals of the platinum group were carried out with the assistance of Fourcroy, and it is likely that they preceded Smithson Tennant in the discovery of iridium. In his researches in organic chemistry, Vacayen discovered quinic acid, asparagine, and camphoric acid. He was the author of two works, Instruction sur la combustion de végétaux, la fabrication de saline, de la Sandra Gravelli, 1794, and Manuel de Essayer, 1812, both which passed through several editions. The leading chemists of Great Britain and Sweden at the time when Lavoisier began his attack on the phlogistic theory strongly opposed the new chemistry. Cavendish, Priestley, Bergman, and Scheele were unable to accept it but black renounced the old doctrine in seventeen ninety one and was followed by dixon and richard kirwan the latter's interesting essay on phlogiston and the constitution of acids seventeen eighty seven 
deals with the transition period from the old to the new theories and was translated into french by mademoiselle lavoisier among the lesser celebrities in the science in england lubbock subscribed himself to lavoisier's views as early as seventeen eighty four while peart and pew attempted to prove the existence of phlogiston as late as seventeen ninety five in eighteen ten a small essay on combustion was published in philadelphia by a mrs fulham wherein the phlogistic and antiphlogistic hypotheses are proved erroneous this is merely mentioned on account of its being one of the earliest american contributions to the subject martin heinrich klaproth seventeen forty three to eighteen seventeen first professor of chemistry at the university of berlin was characterized by the accuracy with which he carried out his investigations the quantitative method of research was developed and improved by him and he thereby helped on the recognition of the cardinal principles advocated by lavoisier after klaproth had become satisfied with the correctness of the antiphlogistic doctrine by testing the reactions which took place in combustion and calcination he became one of its devoted adherents and his example led many other german chemists in the same direction klaproth discovered uranium seventeen eighty nine titanium seventeen ninety four cerium eighteen o three and zirconia seventeen eighty nine and investigated the new elements chromium beryllium and tellurium discovered by muller von reichenstein in seventeen eighty two he was particularly active in analytical and mineralogical chemistry and introduced many improvements of analytical methods klaproth was in fact a true investigator in every sense of the word in reporting the results of analysis he published the actual figures obtained thus introducing a new custom which made it possible to subject results to correction or criticism his works are Chemische Unterschung der Mineralkunden zu Karlsbad, 1790, and Beitrage zur Chemischen Kenntnis der Mineralkörper, 1795 to 1815. The latter is a collection of his papers published in the Memoirs of the Berlin Academy and in the Chemische Annalen für die Freunde der Naturalen. He also published the Chemisches Wörterbuch, 1807 to 10 five volumes eighteen fifteen to nineteen four volumes a french edition of which appeared in eighteen eleven and edited the third edition of friedrich grand's systematis handbook de germain chemie an excellent treatise first published in seventeen eighty seven to ninety from eighteen o three to ten klaproth was on the board of editors of the nuez et la magines journal de chemie which was started in 1798 by Shearer. In this connection, it should be mentioned at that time, about 12 chemical periodicals were being published in Germany, three in France, two in Italy, two in Belgium, one each in Holland and Sweden, and two in England. These journals exercised the greatest influence upon the enlargement and diffusion of chemical knowledge, and they show the extent to which chemistry was fostered during the last decades of the eighteenth century. End of section thirteen. Recording